I'm super happy to be here and to have this opportunity to present um, something that I've been kind of working on and thinking about in the last few months um, and also years while I've been uh, in this crypto blockchain community. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. So um, maybe a short introduction. Um, I'm actually doing this presentation because um, in the last few months, I've been also involved in a research that I'm helping uh, Angela from token engineering community with. Um, and we have done uh, quite a lot of interviews of uh, projects building blockchain uh, solutions uh, or Web3 projects. Um, and I was, I was thinking about this legal perspective, but also uh, this legal perspective connected to the funding. Um, so most of the startups, most of the organizations that are out there are struggling with the funding. Um, funding is essential to what uh, they're doing uh, is actually it, it helps them um, come to, to a solution or to realize their potential and their um, actually come to, to the goal they, they set them for. Uh, but uh, there have been so many different um, like ideas and changes and also um, this legal uncertainty that is omnipresent uh, during these times and also since the beginning of, of uh, blockchain, I would say. Uh, so I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about what I see is happening in the space. And of course, this is not um, legal advice, but it's more an, an analysis of what has have been happening in the past, but also um, what could you as a project, as a startup um, do today to actually have um, a better understanding of what is the legal situation uh, for you. Um, so um, why, why I am talking about surviving, uh, surviving actually means having a lot of funding for you to for your startup to to work and i think that doing a legal analysis of whatever you're doing if you are building um, a startup if you're building a blockchain network if you're having an organization or uh, decentralized autonomous organizations it's very important that you understand what is the um, legal framework that you're working within but also what are the implications like how can you be if you want to be compliant with the law so um I think this is very important from the beginning but it's also important uh in the future and having this uh, constant monitoring of what is happening out there, it's also very important for uh, a blockchain organization. Uh, so the legal analysis is actually, um, it's, it's the kind of also defining uh, the framework within which you're building or designing your business idea, your organization or network or DAO um, at the beginning, but also it's helping you with the funding strategy uh, with your timeline and, of course, also with the market that you want to address. So it's very different if you want to build a solution or a product for uh, US or for the European market, for example. Um, and also, um, I would stress here again the funding strategy. Uh, it might be possible to do uh, something like an ICO a few years ago. Of course, we all know that it's not possible to do that again. But there are so many other um, new projects that are want to help blockchain startups, especially in the Ethereum community, uh, to find a way to crowdfund um, their idea and um, their their project. So uh, being actually aware of what's mm. happening is also very important. Um, why why am I talking about the legal analysis? It might be something um, that is obvious. It might be obvious for, for example, um, startups out there that they need to do that from the beginning. But I think it's very important uh, in this space because of the novelty of the technology. Uh, the technology actually allows us to transfer value without intermediaries. And this is actually why the, the I would say the legal system is actually built. It's to um, oversee this value transmission. Um, and this is why we have so much regulation around banks and fintech. And of course, uh, blockchain and tokens and digital money is just... Um, disrupting all of this so it's also from the beginning very important to understand if we um if we can be or how can we be compliant 
Um, the second part is uh, that in the past we know what has happened and a lot of projects were so enthusiastic about the possibilities and about uh, the, the technology that they didn't really uh, spend a lot of time uh, doing the legal analysis and this is actually how uh, a word look like for a project that uh, did an ICO a few years ago. It was just uh, like a digital word without uh, barriers. Um, and they, I mean, you could, or you did um, a legal, um, not, not a legal, but a global ICO, um, which is actually not the reality. And this is the reality. If you want to be compliant um, with whatever you're doing, you need to be compliant in every country that you want to operate in, or uh, a country that you want um, your um, to offer your tokens, for example. And it's very, very complex. Um, it might not be the perfect example, but I would say it's very similar to what's happening right now, for example, with the coronavirus. Um, so if there is a person that has the virus or if there is just a person uh, out there um, in a specific country, um, there are different laws and different like regulation in every and each country. So you would need to understand what can you do if you're in Italy today or what is it possible to go out or um, is it different if you're, for example, in Singapore oh. at the moment? Um, the third part is uh, that the decentralized models um, of our organizations are so different from the inherently uh, centralized legal framework that we have today. So the legal reality is centralized. And I think one of the best examples is actually the GDPR. It's uh, the regulation for um, data protection or privacy in, in Europe. Um, and actually this uh, regulation, this framework uh, is designed for organizations that are centralized. Um, and it's basically almost impossible to be legally compliant if you didn't think about that from the beginning when you were designing um, your decentralized network, for example. So um, maybe the network was designed before this um, regulation came into place or it was after, but again, I would stress that it's very important to just follow what is happening out there. And uh, the fourth thing is um, that we have different types of organizations. Um, there are not just startups or corporations. So this is what I learned and what I think it's very important um, in this uh, research that we're doing with the token engineering community. So uh, we don't have one specific goal in this uh, organization or in this uh, community. We have different goals. Um, we don't just think about building new business models or um, building um, something that would maximize our revenues or disrupting uh, a specific industry. But some of the organizations, uh, what is their purpose? They are stating that they want to build new economies and they want to build maybe new open source project, projects. They want to build something that didn't exist before. Um, and if you think about it from the legal perspective, it's even more complicated to be compliant if you want to do something that didn't exist before. Um, so I think that when you, we have this idea of um, what can we actually do today um, might be very little, but some of the organizations, for example, um, do think about it. Okay, let's build something today, and and not be that big, or wait for for the like legal framework, or for for the um, for us to understand better, to have better legal certainty, uh, and then maybe go and and build uh, a bigger. Um, a bigger project and i think that we need to be um, very careful here here and also a uh, thing uh, long term so um the reality again is that when there's something new it always happens first in the society and then the law always follows so, so this is something that is uh, written in latin but it oh, it means that there's always something um, first in the society and then the law follows and that that's unfortunate for us but uh, we need to go out there and experiment in a way and then we'll we'll learn what the law and what the regulation will say about what we're what we're doing um, so for example um, we remember a few years ago 
ago when the SEC first said that some tokens were uh, securities and this um, influenced a lot of what was happening in the next years uh, with the, the token design and also with ICOs, with the way how we were raising funds. Um, the recently, we also had uh, more optimistic news from the SEC uh, saying that something like a safe harbor would be possible and that maybe some sort of ICOs would be possible again. So again, this is very important for somebody that is building something today and would maybe uh, like to raise funds in that way. Uh, the second thing is that um, already existing organizations um, have so much um, expenses just to be, keep being compliant with the laws that might be there or just with the laws that are going to um, be defined in the future. So uh, you can see here Kraken saying that um, there's like um, rising cost of compliance for crypto exchanges in general. And again, I would stress here that it's very important when we think about um, fundraise because it's it would be ideal if you would know how much you would spend per year on being compliant. But as we can see here, um, the costs are just raising and it was impossible for Kraken a few years ago when they started to understand how much this would cost, for example. Um, but again, they just need to, um, to follow. If you can uh, see here on the left uh, corner, uh, 2015, it was the to total funds that um, um, they uh, total requests that they received from different jurisdictions, and then you can see the raise in 2019. Um, it's um, it's just incredible how much time and money you need to spend uh, on that. So um, this was sort of an introduction, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about two phenomena that are uh, very present in this ecosystem is a DAO and a token, but it's something that doesn't exist in the legal uh, sphere again. Uh, like a DAO or a token is not something that um, a lawyer would understand without reading about it, without uh, really understanding the model behind it, and it's not a legal term. So for example, for DAOs, uh, some lawyers are using different legal terms that might be uh, BB LLC or foundation or cooperative or general partnership. It really depends how um, this organization is defined. And for example, for tokens is the same. It's very uh, hard to say, oh, this token is a security and this one is a utility. Again, a utility token is not something that the lawyer understand. It's not a legal term. So there are so many different terms that are used in different jurisdictions, like a financial instrument, electronic money, uh, security, virtual token, etc. So talking about the DAO, um, there, I think that most of us, we do understand, or we do have an idea of what a DAO is. And whenever we bring up a DAO, the first thing that usually people do is define a DAO. I, I wouldn't go there. I wouldn't talk about it today, but I want to um, actually um, think about a DAO from the legal perspective. And that means that if I want to have a DAO, if you want to have an organization that is decentralized, um, what can I do from the legal perspective? Can I um, like go into relationship with other DAOs or other legal entities? Uh, is it possible to do that today? Um, and mostly it is not, uh, but it really depends on your, um, what is your activity? What is the industry that you're working in? What is your legal framework? Where are you um, actually, if there, there are some, um, some, some people, where, where are they uh, located? Um, but usually DAOs are connected to a legal entity um, today, as of today, uh, and most of them are maybe connected to cooperative models or some non-profit organizations like foundations uh, or a combination of a profit or a non-profit model. Um, and some of them say that DAOs are actually a network of organizations. So we have more of them and there might be profit and non-profit. Uh, organizations. And I will stress here again that it's not that easy as saying, oh yeah, this is a startup or this is a for-profit organizations. We have so much um, already methodology. Um, and I think also when it comes to funding, we understand how um, 
I mean, what are the KPIs, for example, if you uh, are raising funds? Um, what are the investors looking for uh, if you want uh, to build a startup today? Uh, but in terms of organizations that are built within this ecosystem, uh, there's um, there's a big variety, and it's it's really important for us to understand what is what is that you want to build, and then apply uh, to maybe the the way of funding that um, you want to to use. So there have been a lot of innovation in this space, in this DAO space. Uh, I would say that uh, we lawyers are always fascinated by uh, the innovation that comes from the technical part, but also um, like the, um, I would say the innovation that comes from lawyers that are working in the uh, blockchain ecosystem is, is actually um, immense, immense. And um, we we all know about uh, the law and how, um, people that are uh, working in this project want to um, actually facilitate um, the fundraising, but also the uh, opening of different organizations for uh, the Ethereum startups. Then you're probably familiar with the BB LLC. Um, those are both solutions uh, that are actually um, coming from the uh, US um, legal framework. Um, and I think that this is also very important for us to know where we want to actually um, be located or where uh, which market do, do we want to address. Um, the second part that is that is also very interesting to me personally is uh, the idea that we can do something also long term, not just short term. So the thing that I was talking till now was something that is connected to what a startup can do today and what what can they use, for example, today. Uh, but there are a group of lawyers um, you're probably familiar with um, from the Koala organizations, the Coalition of Automated Legal Applications, that is um, working very intensely um, intensely on the model law for DAOs, um, I would say for a year, something like that. Um, and actually the aim is to build something um, that is not possible to build um, short term, but it's something that uh, would might be um, a solution, uh, but we still need to wait some time for it to be um, implemented. So actually the model law would assist governments in crafting their own DAO laws. The idea is that uh, we would want to have a DAO or an organization um, that is autonomous and decentralized in a way that we understand it and that that means that existing laws do not permit it at the moment and we would need to change the laws that are out there so the call organizations is actually organization is actually um trying to design this model law that could be used by different governments in order to um actually design this DAO law or at least change the laws that they have right now in order for the uh, for a DAO to be uh, to be legal or to be possible in that jurisdiction. Um, so the model law um, in general are are something that are, are is used um, and it is usually used um, by by different um, international organizations. Um, and it usually proposes a series of law uh, to a specific subject. Um, and usually um, these governments um, then can use it or um, reject it or adopt it uh, in whole or in part, but it actually helps them um, to design this um, law. So, um, the, the purpose of the model law is actually to attempt to uh, homogenize all the state's laws on a particular subject. I think that would be very useful for a DAO, which, um, and also for, for the whole space, because if we are building something, we want to build something that is actually um, global. So if there would be laws that would be aligned um, from different jurisdictions, that would be something that is actually working within the, the spirit, within what we understand the spirit of uh, a DAO is. Um, so the model law, as I said, usually assists countries in framing a certain legislation. And we uh, are very familiar with model laws from uh, different uh, international organizations like the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law, which uh, designed a model law on electronic commerce. And the idea is actually 
uh, to design a legislation that would enable and facilitate electronic commerce and electronic government to provide equal treatment to paper-based and electronic information. Um, so this was something that I think was very innovative and that is used by um, some countries, but we were looking into that and thinking about, can we do something uh, for the DAOs? And what this model law was using is the functional equivalence approach. Um, that means that um, it evaluates the underlying purposes and functions of a traditional paper-based legal requirements. And then um, it actually looks into uh, and assesses to what extent the electronic transitions can meet the purpose of those purpose and functions. So can we actually use electronic tr transactions um, instead of the paper-based legal requirements. And then the last, the very important part, the model law gives equal status to the electronic transactions because they can satisfy the purpose and the functions of the paper ones. Um, so again, a very interesting approach that we also used when drafting the Koala model law for DAOs um, and we were thinking about the specific legal rights and specific obligations that we understand that DAOs might or want to have. Um, and then again, uh, using the functional equivalence approach, um, satisfying the uh, relevant legal provisions through technological means. So can we actually do something because it is on the blockchain do we really need to comply with the rules that are out there, but we can, with this functional approach, use the technology in order to, um, or this technological guarantees um, afforded by the blockchain in order to satisfy the requirements. So this is something that is ongoing. Um, and of course, when this law is going to be drafted, um, then we need to have a presentation and also talk to different governments if they would be interested in actually using that. Uh, but I think it's a very um, interesting and in, innovative approach to uh, when we talk about DAOs. So the second part um, of this presentation again uh, are the tokens. And I think that um, for the tokens, it was very, very important for us, I would say two years ago, to have different communication with, with regulators. Um, that, would have, that was happening all over um, the world. And I know mostly about what was happening in Europe. Um, there are organizations in every country almost um, that were and are willing to talk to the regulators uh, to actually um, make them understand what the blockchain is about, what um, are those projects, what do those projects want to achieve, and um, made them feel that um, you know you, they have someone to talk to if they um, if they would want to um, you know understand that better or maybe change uh, a law or something similar. There are different approaches uh, to that. Um, I would say also within Europe uh, there were sand sandboxes. Um, new regulations um, framed, uh, also just opinions. I would say that almost every um, authority uh, in, in EU, EU um, of a certain state, they issued an opinion on this. And I think that this is very helpful when we think about legal certainty and legal uncertainty. Uh, the first ICOs that were out there were talking to the regulators directly. Uh, now we have some opinions that we can use. Um, and I think this is much, I mean, it's much easier for us lawyers, but of course it's much easier for projects too. Um, so I am just going to present very quickly a few um, definitions of tokens. For example, from in fin Finma uh, from Switzerland is the Swiss authority. They um, they have three different types of token: is the payment token, utility token, in and the asset token. Um, then uh, Malta was uh, a um, country that also had a new law uh, on the blockchain and tokens. So they have the financial instruments, electronic money, virtual tokens, and virtual financial assets. Uh, and also Liechtenstein uh, that has um, the, this container model that they're using, um, that they say that they have 
tokens that are empty like bitcoin or loaded or packaged into a, uh, or things that are loaded and packaged into a token uh, with different rules licenses duties and similar stuff and i think that this um idea of a, of a container is very interesting when you think about tokens because again a token is not um, a legal terminology so when we understand what a token is, we need to look into what are the functionalities and what is the purpose of a token. And uh, to the lawyers, they don't really care about what we write in our white papers on our website, but they really need to understand what is this, why is this token designed for? And I think that when we are talking about token uh, engineering and token design, it is very important to have this legal perspective out there um, because uh, as I said, already from the beginning, already when we are designing the system and especially the token, because um, it's going to influence a lot um, on our, I would say, funding strategy, but also of what can we actually do um, with this uh, token, but also what uh, jurisdictions can we um, work within uh, when we are thinking um, about the token. Um, and again, going back to the legal analysis, um, thinking about DAOs and tokens, um, I think that I, I can say in general, um, it is the, the complexity uh, of, of, I would say, the legal compliance or the legal setup. Uh, it really depends on the industry. If we are working within, within the industry that is uh, very reg regulated, it's much harder. Um, and we need to spend, for example, more money. <laughs> we need to raise more funds. Uh, it, uh, again, it's um, important which market jurisdiction we are working uh, in. Um, the funding strategy, if we want to have um, for example, tokens and have something similar to uh, an ICO. So um, have um, an offer, open offer, um, or uh, again, the legal entity when you talk about the DAO um, and the design and, and the definition of a token, of course. So many projects because of that, um, when it comes to decentralization are thinking about um, maybe decentralization in the second phase, if they have more phases um, of, like for example, when we think about our timeline, uh, because it's very hard uh, to to set up um, the whole structure for, uh, um, I would say, completely decentralized organization right now, and it's really hard to interact with the other organizations because, um, again, of the legal uncertainty. So one of the um, I would say strategies is also to maybe uh, think in phases and uh, design something first that we know that we can um, maybe deliver or prototype and then think about some things um, maybe long term. Um, again, when we were doing this research and we are still doing this research, uh, the problem solution fit is a very important part. And again, uh, here the legal compliance uh, helps a lot. Um, from the beginning so we don't need to be surprised later and say oh i didn't know this was not compliant and uh, because of that we would need to raise more funds and maybe our project is doomed to fail uh, because we didn't have enough funding so um i would say that it's almost it, everything can be done also from the legal point of view but the important part is the funding so we, if we don't have enough funds we might just not survive this process uh, so actually to conclude, um, again, I would just say that it's very important to evaluate your business idea from the beginning and also follow up uh, with um, like staying informed with whatever is happening out there. Um, and also in some cases communicate with the regulator if you're doing something that is novel and something that is uh, specific to a certain jurisdiction. I think that um, lawyers in this space are um, very aware of it and um, they are doing this uh, because um, in, in a way it is very important to be compliant and law is very strict but at the end of the day it's also something that it's very important to know the person and to have um, a good relationship with the regulator because uh, that is when they're open to um, communicate with you. So thank you very much. I can't even begin to think of where to ask you a question because it's just I really take no issue with it. It's just straight out and 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 clear. Um, yeah, 
maybe I can add something. Um, like when I'm talking to my colleagues that are lawyers uh, working in the blockchain space, we're always saying that it's really hard for us to talk to each other. Like I think you had this discussion with Anya before. So if you're talking to um, a lawyer, to a programmer, uh, we all have our specific terminology that we use. And I think that what is very important in this space is to try to understand each other and actually to have like a way of um, actually translating, you know, our words that we use. In so which legal back? So what, which which legal regime would you say that you that you belong to? Common law. No. Uh, which, which side of the fence are you on? U European law. So I mean. Just when we're talking to each other in the crypto space, it's like it's like lawyers talking to each other across across legal regimes, right? Yeah. You know, they come from their tradition, um, whether it's religious ba uh, uh, religiously based or or you know uh, a commons based approach, um, and then so you take that sort of like intertribalism that we have in crypto, and that 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 sort of like interspecies tribalism that you have in in, in legal. And you combine those two things, man, that's just really a brew for, for misunderstanding. Uh, so I, I understand what you're saying for, for reaching out, you know, but I mean, just imagine, you know, uh, that sort of interspecies arguing that you have in your sector, right? You yeah, know I mean? yeah, yeah, yeah. Literally are not on the same page and not, not talking the same language, right? So it's, it's really a stretch then out cross sector when you have cross sector tribalisms as well, the libertarians that we have, and the and the and the crypto anarchists, and you know the sovereign citizens, and the maximalists, and the and the and the builders, right? And then all the scammers. I mean, it's a, it's 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 not an easy bridge to cross. Yeah. Um. When when what's happening is so diverse across our sector, right? You guys are much narrower set of 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 differences than what we have in the crypto space. Yeah, I think that's very interesting. And it's also, I mean, you can see that when you when you go to different conferences and visit different events, you have certain, like you said, tribes and you know exactly, you know, it's just something that has, um, I mean, that we are doing something that is like political uh, because we have different uh, values. Um, and when I was saying it's not just a startup, it's not something that you're just, you have something and you want to raise money, you know exactly what your KPIs are, what you need to do. Um, it's, we want to build another system, ecosystem. Um, and there are so many different things to that, um, that um, yeah, are just interesting. So I've watched so many companies go through this founder's curse mm -hmm. of having a great idea and getting the funding for it mm -hmm. and then having all of these responsibilities. And so what I've been, what I've been looking for is saying, okay, where are the areas of what it is that we're developing? So in, in cyber jurisdictions mm -hmm. that are the, the leaders for the existing jurisdictions, like what are the mappings, you know, like the Dow project, uh, uh, the Lao in, in the yeah. state where they're doing compliance uh, with, with LLCs, I think is a great thing, right? Yeah. We have to be working in that area as, as teachers and enablers uh, in legacy systems to, to bring these things that we know that work and are more efficient for us mm -hmm. that are then accepted and rulable on in, in meat space jurisdictions, you know? Yeah, exactly. Like having something like a template or something like building blocks that you can use when you want, want to build something. Uh, but I would say that it's, it's very hard uh, because if you're a maker, if you're a builder, a founder, you want to focus on what you're best on you want to build something you don't want to think about like you're saying all this other stuff like legal part and like maybe hr uh and some other things but it was uh, i was working with blockchain projects from 2018 on um also work with some icos and i saw like you were saying this burden this huge burden um all of the sudden you just got a huge amount of funding and then you were basically um, almost as a publicly traded company. You need to communicate with your crowd. You need to build something that is really hard to build. You, you have so many uncertainties from the legal point of view and so many others. 
uh, that you need to overcome. And I think that people that are still doing that and projects that are still alive, uh, I would say in the last two, three years are doing a huge, huge job. Um, and yeah, like chapeau to them because um, it's it's incredible, like the amount of innovation and actually they are pioneers in this space. So whatever they are doing, some other projects can just look at it and maybe do something similar. Uh, but the problem that I see right now that is in the space is the funding part. Um, so it's not possible to, to get funding um, in that way. It's like crowdfunding is very limited, I would say. Um, and most of the startups are um, raising equity, uh, which can be then problematic when we think about decentralization and having a line in the, the, the problem is the ethics, right? I mean, so the scam coiners, they just do what they do yeah. and run away. But people that actually want to build and deliver something can't really just take money and run away. Exactly. I mean, right? or, or take money and stay. Yeah. If you take money and stay, yeah. you know. Um, so a last last comment that I want to make. So if you wanted today to release an open source protocol um, that would be untraceable to a user that did, that did the code in the way that Satoshi did, it's literally almost impossible. You're fingerprintable just from your coding style. You can't like create an identity and release a protocol, yeah, in a way it, it's it's almost it can't be duplicated uh, uh, in the way that it was done with Satoshi, right? Yeah. So even if you're a known coder, right, and you say I'm going to create this this identity, yeah, then it's going to be a clean machine. It's going to be a clean GitHub ID. You know, you have a code signature on how you write your code, huh? and the state monopoly on power will always come after the individual. Yeah, there's just no way to avoid individual liability, which is why I've been making the recommendation to people that the best protection that we have to offer is our limited, limited liability uh, legacy companies and not all of these cyberspace um, solutions that we're building, if you're going to actually operate in meat space. You know? Yeah. Um, I mean, this is a very interesting comment. Like if we think about Bitcoin and Ethereum, for example, the SEC just said, I mean, you know, a few years later, when they were already out there and existing, they said, oh, this is not a security because it's decentralized enough. And this is also the comment that I made before when the SEC thinks about having this um, three year period, for example, for you to have the time to build something that can be decentralized um, that or needs to be decentralized in three years or um, needs to be owned by, by um, a big, group of people. Uh, but why I would really like recommend if some people are interested in these topics to read uh, Primavera de Filippi's book. And there is a section there where she actually describes exactly in very detail where um, how how the, the state can can intervene or can actually influence what's happening on the blockchain uh, side on the, the network. Um, and I think this is, it's very interesting. So I've always been following these legal arguments and mm -hmm. I find them to be um, incredibly fascinating area of, of, of where we're at. It's, it's, it's an open field. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's, it's an open field. Um, and I, I think that just because there's a necessity for projects to have legal advice, that there is slowly a, a convergence, there's slowly a syncretism happening where the ideas are percolating. I think the, the, the main problem is, is that our space moves so fast. Yeah. Move fast, break things, iterate, 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 iterate. And law is based on precedent. So there's also this conflict between the fact that we're building things that we know that work mm -hmm. with, you know, and then competing with legal regimes that, that move at a snail's pace, yeah? It's, uh, yeah. it's, it's just born for disaster. Um, <laughs> You're right. You know, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I'm fascinated by the number of people that are non-lawyers, but they are interested in the legal part in this space. So this is, I think this is amazing. Um, and I think it's very, like, it's even more important for us to try to explain things in a way that other people would understand and not use our, you know, like, terminology. And the second part is, uh, while doing this research, 
I have heard so many times the legal, the technical part is not a problem. We can do that. You know, we can code the smart contract. The legal part is what is missing and when we don't have a solution to. So I hope that, yeah, that, that this is going to improve. <laughs>